going a short distance, I turned around and there were two or three robed Arabs behind me, between me and that hole I didn't on the wall I just came through. So I thought, you know, this just doesn't look good or it doesn't feel good. But we I went on in and to the square of this town, I guess. It's called the Casbah. And there was a, a hotel and I went up to the plate glass window. I'm standing out on a sidewalk looking in and there there's nothing in there. I expected to see American military, but there was no American military. These are all uh, what they call French revolutionaries, uh, partisans, uh, and they were having a gay old time in there. So I said, this is, this is not where I want to be. So I just stopped and, and backed up against the plate glass window and I said, well, what am I going to do now? And uh, so this little Arab kid is there and I said, I want to go, I want to go back. Okay, he said, we'll get you a taxi. And I said, well, what do you mean a taxi? I walked in, I'll walk out. <laughs> he said, uh, and the taxi was a uh, bicycle, three-wheel bicycle. With a seat. I didn't want any part of that, but uh, it didn't seem it didn't seem like I was going to get any out any other way. So I was, as I approached this bicycle with the uh, operator of the bicycle, they began to form a real close circle around me. And uh, I, you know, the situation just didn't, wasn't good. Fortunately for me, I saw the headlights of uh, an, an American military vehicle. It looked like it was about maybe a couple of blocks away, but he was coming towards us. And this this was a military police patrol, and they can spot situations like that. They probably saw this gathering in the middle of this intersection and figured there's something wrong. So they were approaching that, and when they got within just a few feet, I just ducked my head and charged through this line. Of, of, these guys were held shoulder to shoulder, all in a circle around me. And they were trying to put an Arab robe over me because they knew that if the military patrol saw my uniform, then they're, they'd be through. Their intent was to just take me out in the desert somewhere, and it had happened before, and uh, take what they could get off of you. But boy, when I came through that circle, uh, when I, these guys in that vehicle jumped out and they had their guns in their hands, and they were ready for anything. But they said, now, what are you doing? I said, well, I don't know, but I want out. <laughs> so that was Marrakech. And from there we flew to Tunis, North Africa, which is uh, Tunisia on the southern Mediterranean coast, just across from Italy. And then the next leg of the flight was into Gioia, Italy. And that's where we left the airplane, and that was a, a sort of a, uh, a depot where they Almost all aircraft that can't come over to any theater uh, undergoes what they call theater modifications. They make minor changes to the armament or uh, gun stations or whatever to coincide with the type of combat they're experiencing in that area. So that uh, so we left the airplane there, of course, and then we were trucked in a big military six by six truck from that point to our base. And our base consisted of an aerodrome and our uh, and a headquarters some distance and I will I will say it was probably two miles from the aerodrome itself, the landing field. And then adjacent to or fairly close to the uh, headquarters building was an olive orchard with uh, about a three foot high stone fence around the olive orchard. And when we uh, reported to the uh, location, at, uh, it was late afternoon by the time we got there on this particular day. And this now we're in, in early December of 1944. 
and then we were given uh, the officers of the crew, and there would be four officers on a crew. The two pilots and bombardier, bombardier and navigator were officers. We were given a 16-foot pyramid tent, which is a 60-foot square with a winded roof, I guess. And uh, I said, there it is, put it up. If you, if you get it up in time, you'll have a place to sleep tonight. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we had no trouble with that. We got our tent up. And, uh, and that was the, uh, inside the olive orchard. And that was uh, our introduction to our combat quarters, location, surroundings and what have you for the time we were there. Uh, almost immediately uh, uh, started uh, flying combat missions. We would fly a mission every three days. You'd fly a mission and then you, you, you wouldn't fly for two days and then you'd fly. You'd be scheduled for, a, for another mission. So uh, every three days you'd fly at least mm -hmm. one mission. Mm -hmm. Occasionally uh, I know that there was one occasion, and it might have been more, where I flew two days in a row, but usually it was one out of three days. And at 25 missions would, uh, was a combat tour. After, after completing 25 combat missions, then you would be sent back, back home. And of course, having arrived there in December of 1944, between that point in time and uh, the fifth, actually eighth of May, it was when it was over, was when I flew my missions. I just barely got in enough missions to, mm -hmm. to have a complete you know, combat tour. Uh, combat missions, uh, a typical combat mission would they they'd come around and, and in your to your tent and shine a flashlight in your face and say it's time to get up. And you get up and uh, and go to uh, we, had, we had a mess facility just outside of this uh, stone wall around the olive orchard and have breakfast, which consisted of some form of spam and dehydrated uh, powdered eggs. I guess it was. we had dehydrated potatoes and powdered eggs. That's what we lived mm -hmm. and spam. But we'd have breakfast. And if the, uh, they had a radio, and if the radio was playing the Vienna Waltz, we knew when we walked in the breakfast that we were going to be bombing Vienna that day. This was Axis Sally playing the Vienna Waltz, telling us that they already knew where we were going. Where we were going. But, uh, and they pretty much did, you know, there was that kind of thing was typical warfare, I guess. Then we'd go to our uh, briefing, our early morning briefing, and we'd, our takeoffs would be just after uh, dawn, and uh, our missions would be six and a half to seven and a half hours long, and in a B-17 there's no pressurization. There's no such thing as cabin heat in a B-17 at 30,000 feet when the temperature is 55 degrees below zero outside that's going to keep you warm. So we were <coughs> electrically heated individually. In other words, when we get up in the morning, we'd put on our long underwear first, then we'd put our electric suits on, including boots. And we'd put the boots on, and then, well, we'd put the pants on, put the boots on, and They'd plug into each other down around the ankles, then you put your vest on and then plug into the pants at the waist. And then over that you put your fur line flying suit. And then when you get in the airplane, you plug that into the airplane and that's that's your heat. <laughs> and each individual had this uh, type of a, a heat suit, I guess you would call it. To, uh, because you, you it was so cold that if you laid your bare hand on piece of metal, it would stick there. So you have to be pretty careful about that. But uh, then we would uh, take off and climb out over the Adriatic. On We always had to climb out over the Adriatic Sea 
and get enough altitude to fly over the Alp Mountains. And Vienna was often our target because it was uh, one of the big German oil refining complexes. And when, that's what we were after, was uh, knocking out their oil supply. And when we do that, we pretty well ground their airplanes and bring their uh, surface vehicles to a halt, and it's, it pretty much incapacitates them uh, to deprive them of oil and fuel. So that was our mission. I remember uh, we had fighter escort that would, after we'd get out over the Adriatic, they would take off an hour or so after we did because they flew much faster than we did. So they knew they could catch us by the time we'd get into hostile territory and they would escort us uh, and protect us from any enemy fighter planes until they were out of range. In other words, they didn't have the range that we had as bombers, but they could stay with us for quite a while and then we'd get pretty much into the target area and they'd have to go back. But I remember one mission way <laughs> when I looked out and I saw this B-17. Now we're flying B-17s, that's in a U.S. airplane. But here is the B-17 setting off our wing out here with a German cross on it. And I, I jumped out of my skin. I couldn't wait to get back and, and tell the debriefing officer about this B-17 I saw with this German insignia on it. Of course, up in the, up there on the mission in the air, you, you, have, you can't you're, you have radio silence, so you can't get into a discussion about that. But when I got back, they started laughing when I started mentioning it. And I said, "Well, you know what he was doing, don't you?" And I said, "No, I don't." He says, "Well, he was radioing down to the flak gunners on the ground what your altitude was and what your speed was and what your heading is, so they'll be ready for you when you get there." <laughs> That's so great. Okay. Well, it did seem, I don't know that his information was all that necessary because they always seemed to be pretty well ready for us when we got there with our flak. We did see a lot of flak. I've had as many as 65 holes put in my airplane. Had the hydraulic system knocked out once, a couple of flat tires. Uh, but, uh, Never got a scratch. None of uh, my crew members ever got a scratch. We always made it back. It's wonderful. And, uh, so it's uh, combat was exhilarating an exhilarating experience, but it's an experience that somehow you are not personally involved to the point of being anxious about it. If you ever get to that point, you're more of a danger to yourself and your crew than the enemy is. And uh, I had that experience. There was customary that when you uh, first go over and uh, get assigned to a combat unit, they would assign you to a crew that's got that's already been involved in combat and has combat experience, and it kind of to get a kind of an indoctrination into what combat missions are like, flying combat missions. Well, they put me with this uh, this guy who was the first pilot of the B-17. Had 22 missions. I think this was his 22nd mission. But he was scared to death. He did not think he was going to, he just knew something was going to happen to him before he got to 25th mission. The closer he got to 25 missions, the more mm -hmm. anxiety he was experiencing. So he tells me, and typically on a combat mission you've got two pilots in the airplane and you fly 30 minutes and the other one flies 30 minutes and you just alternate. Of course you're flying close formation for the whole time on the mission. So you need to relieve one another, spare one another. He told me, he says, I'm going to fly all but 10 minutes out every hour. I thought, well, 
it's your mission. If that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. <clears throat> so we uh, we were climbing out and we were going up over the Alps and we were in instrument and we were in the clouds. We could see the plane that we were flying instruments on, flying formation on. And we could have no, didn't have a problem keeping in formation, but you couldn't see around. Well, somehow or another, he got a little bit too slow and he stalled the airplane out. <laughs> well, when you stall an airplane, unless you do something to get that airplane out of that stall, it's going down. It's, it will no longer continue to fly. And of course he was, now he was panicking and, and I looked out the wing and I could see through a hole in the crowd, clouds, a small area I could see through and I could see the side of a mountain and I thought, man, you know, that's, so I, I just, I swung with my right hand across the cockpit and just hit him in the, in the chest and knocked him off the controls and I took the controls of the airplane and was, spun up the wrist at uh, uh, turbocharger control and uh, dropped the nose to it so I could pick up some speed and break the stall and then establish a, a, a climb out. But now as we're not flying formation, I'm just flying this airplane on a, I took up a heading so I could go away from the formation. I didn't want to uh, take a chance of uh, you know, running into the formation. So I, I climbed out like that till I got on top of the clouds. And we broke out and it's just beautiful sparkling clear blue up up above these clouds, you know. And he says, let's go home. I said, well, you know, we can't go home now. If you go home now, you won't even get credit for your mission. Besides, I can see the formation over there and I can see our spot in the formation. Let's just rejoin. Which we did. But our mission that day was to go back down to 12,000 feet for our bombing run. We spent, we had to go back down through this, these clouds. Well, we get back down in the clouds and the guy 